So we've uh, talked about homology, and if you remember, um, homology is similar characters that are inherited from a common ancestor. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at this. This is a phylogeny, of course. We see long legs are a homologous trait from a common ancestor right here. Before that, at the very base, so remember... This is how old, newer. But this is how, this is a hypothesis about how this evolved. So we've got these shorebirds um, with short legs. The ancestor almost surely had short legs. Okay. And... Also, this one also had short legs, but there was a change, a genetic change almost certainly, that resulted in long legs. Uh, it probably happened gradually, longer and longer legs, but this is what we have currently. So. Long legs are inherited from a common ancestor. The most primitive characteristics for leg length in this uh, bird is short legs. And also, there's another thing going on, uh, long bills. So we've also got long bills in addition to long legs. Okay, good. Okay, so that's inherited from a common ancestor. If it wasn't, it would mean that both of these birds would have independently evolved long legs. In other words, this individual uh, the ancestor would have had short legs, oops, would have had short legs, and then independently there were long legs. But we go for something called parsimony. That means the simplest explanation, and it's much simpler if the ancestor of these two Related species are more closely related and, in fact, Okay, good. So, homology, that's from inheritance from a common ancestor. Okay. Now, there's another way you can get similar features that has nothing to do with common ancestry. And that has to do with common environment. Okay? Uh, if an environment is similar, two different environments, but they're similar in terms of selective force, then... <clears throat> There's only so many solutions that nature can use in terms of ev evolution, okay? So this has nothing to do with inheritance. This has to do with natural selection, okay? So we're going to give another um, an example of what's called analogy.
and this is similar features that are a result of similar selective pressures from similar environments. And it is called convergent evolution. It's an example of natural selection in action where the environment favors the same uh, traits because the environment is similar for both different organisms, even if these organisms are not in any way related to each other. Okay? So this is character similarities due to anything other than descent from a common ancestor. So remember, descent from a common ancestor is due to homology. Character similarities due to anything other than descent from a common ancestor is convergent evolution and analogy. Okay? So let's take a look at this. We've got some birds. Looking at these birds. <clears throat> <coughs> I would surmise, remember we're going so the common ancestor right here was probably had short legs and a smaller body okay and the same thing here And then we have these two birds with bigger bodies and longer tails. Um, it might be due to sexual selection or it might be due to um, uh, living in a dense forest where um, uh, longer tails allows you to maneuver uh, perhaps better. So let's see some sort of habitat. So what happened is, the thing is, over here, right here, remember, um, we had a common ancestor in a new habitat, let's say deeper water, and that selected for longer legs and a longer bill, okay? Um, and it's because their most recent common ancestor is right here, right? And that's the ancestor had a long legs and long bills and then subsequently the two populations were separated and evolved into separate species. Okay, now in terms of common ancestry The bird on the left, blue with a long tail, bigger body size, and the bird next to it, another species, are, they share most recent common ancestor right here. Okay? That means that the long tail had to evolve independently. Right here for this bird. Okay, this bird, the small one, inherited the small body from a previous common ancestor, and you can trace that all the way back down. Okay. So, the two most recent common ancestors, the one with the long tail and the short tail, are more closely related, even if they look differently, than... This bird over here, 
and its most recent common ancestor, which had a short tail. And again, it evolved independently. Okay? So, these two birds with long tails, where do they share our most recent common ancestor? You would have to go all the way down to here, at the base of the phylogeny. In other words, the most ancestral common ancestor farther back in time, not the most recent. So they have similar features, but they're not related, except distantly. Okay, and this is because they had similar environments. Now, uh, with the, um, the shorebirds, um, they also had similar environments at that point right here where it changed but the ancestrals were shorter and had shorter bills okay and probably uh, forged in water that was shallower okay so these two shorebirds are all it took was one change and then subsequent speciation whereas with these these evolved all these different species, one, two, three, four, five, six, and two of them have long tails and a bigger body, but those evolved independently, and that's convergent evolution. Okay. <clears throat> so, convergent evolution results in organisms that appear very much alike, similar, despite not because of common ancestry, vastly different genetics. In other words, genetically, dissimilar. Okay? This is not from common ancestry. This is independent evolution of a trait that fits a more current environment. The characteristics that result are called analogous traits. Homologous implies descent from a common ancestor. Analogous means the traits are similar, but not from common ancestry, but from similar environmental pressures. All processes of natural selection can cause distantly related organisms to evolve similar structures because they survive and reproduce under environmental, similar environmental pressures, not similar ancestry. That includes directional selection, stabilizing, disruptive, balancing, any of those. Okay? Okay. So let's take a look. Distinguishing homology from convergent evolution. So we've got two things here. First of all, we've got a dolphin and we've got an ichthyosaur. Okay? The dolphin is a marine mammal. A uh, hundred million years ago, there was a reptile that evolved to look kind of like a, a dolphin. Why? What was the environment it was in? It was in an ocean. It filled the same niche it went about its business in the same way, making a living and all that, in the same environment as common dolphins, which didn't show up cetaceans or whales, didn't show up for another, um, uh, let's say, 50, uh, 100, mil 100 million, 150 million years. Okay? So they look similar. Now, how do we know this? Well, we've got a phylogeny. So there's the ancestor 
the common ancestor. Now we're looking at it by, by the way, going this way. Okay. And we've got one group that leads to mammals, including a reptile-like mammal called synapsids. Okay? Monotremes, marsupials, dolphins, primates, rodents, they're all mammals. Okay. So, they share most recent common ancestor. The dolphin, marsupial, and then marine mammal. This is the dolphin. Okay. Now, let's go back. Here's the ichthyosaur. We know that ichthyosaurs are more closely related to lizards and snakes than they are to other um, sauropods like birds and dinosaurs. Okay? So, even though these two things look very similar, they share a really distant common ancestor all the way back here. Okay. Okay. So, this is an example of homology. No, I mean um, convergent evolution. In other words, they're not related. They don't share a very recent common ancestor. So it's convert, but they share a similar environment. They both, it turns out this is called um, fusiform body shape, and it's, uh, it's very efficient for moving through water. And so similar selective pressures. They would not look like that if they lived in entirely different environments. For example, dinosaurs don't look anything like these, right? Okay. Now, so that's convergent evolution up here. Which one is homology? Okay, let's go down here. Okay, these are a bunch of different animals. Arthropods include spiders, um, crustaceans, insects, things like that. Annelids are worms. Mollusks are snails, clams, squid, octopus. And then over on another part are echinoderms, sea stars, sand dollars, and our cells. And, oh, we're echinoderms and chordates. Okay? So, it turns out that all animals share a toolkit for the development of their body plan. Okay? Um, and this, these, this toolkit are called Hox genes. Hox genes, I should probably just write that. Okay, now oh, come on. Okay. And this controls body plan. Where the abdomen is, where the head is, how many limbs you have. Do you have any limbs at all? Okay, it turns out all animals share Hox genes. Some of the simplest animals, like... Um, a jellyfish only have a couple of Hox genes. But insects, of course, they're fairly uh, complex animals. They have segmentation, and everything has to end up in the right place. And the Hox genes coordinate that. So it turns out a fruit fly shares the same Hox genes with a human,
here and here, here and here, and here and here, here and here, and here and here, here and here, here and here, here and here. The fly also has um, one, two, three, one, two, three, has four of these red ones, okay, instead of three. So the humans have lost a whole gene. And then there's this other gene, it's purple. And um, we'll just use black. Okay, there. And then the human has an additional, so this is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And this is one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and this is 13. So this. 13 here, a uh, 10 here. And there's 13 for humans. Okay, Hox genes were added, but Hox genes were all inherited. Many of the same exact Hox genes were all inherited from a common ancestor way back in time. For all animals. And for a common ancestor had Hox genes. Okay? And it was not like um, uh, uh, um, a sponge, but probably more like something like a, a jellyfish or something like that. And the Hox genes were passed down to all of these living groups and some extinct groups of animals. Okay? So that's homology. That's actually homologous. Okay? I hope you understand this. Okay. Other examples of convergent evolution. Okay. In North America and South America, we have cactus. Okay, cacti have a whole bunch of features in common, including instead of having tiny leaves, they have big leaves that they can store water in. And they are also very spiny. And where are they found? They're in found in arid environments. Okay, you're not going to find a uh, uh, cactus in a rainforest or something like that. In India, there are parts of the Indian continent that are also very, very dry. And there's this other succulent. It is not at all related to cactus. It evolved independently because the environment was similar, a dry, arid environment. The same thing happened in Africa. Euphorbia is another big plant family, like cactus is another big plant family, and the family that includes this Indian succulent is another one, different one. So these are all unrelated. They do share a common ancestor, but way back in time, the earliest plants. Okay, They're all found in very dry environments, that favor structures where when there it does rain, they can store the water. Okay? Also, this one right here, this is um, a carrion flower. It turns out uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a method of deceit. It actually looks like dead meat and it emits a fragrance of rotting meat. Flies come along, they're gonna lay their eggs in it, they think it's meat, 
that's where they want to lay their eggs, and yet it's a flower, and what the plant is doing is it's deceiving the flies to pollinate. It then a fly goes in, gets the pollen, it lays its eggs for no reason, nothing's going to happen, it flies out and goes to another carrion flower and does the same thing. It gets nothing, but the plant gets pollination. It turns out carrion flowers are also found in the Americas and in Indonesia and um, I think in Australia too, but I'm not sure. The same exact, in fact, one of the biggest flowers in the world, um, oh, it's called, uh, I forget what it is, but it's gigantic and it's a giant carrion flower where it deceives insects to come in, lay their eggs, and inadvertently pollinate. And uh, the insects actually, normally with pollination services, the insects get something in return, namely the pollen and uh, the nectar. These things don't even give out nectar. They just smell like dead, rotten food. Okay, now, so that's convergent evolution. The same thing happens, these are all on the bottom, are nectar feeding animals. There's the Hawaiian honey creeper right here. There's hummingbird from South, um, from South America. And that's where hummingbirds first originated. There are hummingbirds in North America, but most of them are found in South and Central America. In Africa, there's another nectar eater called an African sunbird. Hummingbirds are often very, uh, the males are very uh, um, beautiful, um, sexual selection. The, the African sunbird is too. Uh, it doesn't hover, but it drinks nectar. It's got a beak for that. And then something that's not a bird at all, a hummingbird moth. Okay, it's having a long beak. It's got a proboscis. It feeds in the same sort of flowers with long corolla tubes. So you either have a long beak or a long proboscis, and you get nectar. And in the process, you pollinate the flowers. This time, you're offering pollination services. They don't know that, but they get pollen on them when they feed on the nectar, and then fly to the next flower and pollinate. These are all unrelated species. Obviously, obviously, these share a common ancestor. There are their birds. This is an insect. Okay, and but it's still the same environment. They're nectar feeders. Okay, so it's another example of convergent evolution. Another good example, finally, is think about birds. They can fly, right? They have wings. What else can fly? Oh, insects can fly. So wings in birds and insects they're convergent. They evolved independently. In fact, we know that for sure because you can tell the wings in birds evolve from the limb bones found in tetrapods. Okay? The wings in insects uh, uh, evolved uh, probably from some legs too, but I'm not sure exactly, but it's different. Okay. So this is more convergent evolution. Sharks... And dolphins, they look the same, they look similar, because they both live in a marine environment. Okay, now, there are other forces besides evolution, on evolution by natural selection, and sexual selection. All these last examples of convergent evolution are natural selection and sexual selection. But one of the other forces is mutation. In fact, mutation is the basis for all variation in the genes and also in phenotypes. 
Okay, so here's our mutation. We've seen this again. A change in the sequence of any segment of DNA in an organism. Replication isn't perfect. Mistakes are made. These mistakes that don't get corrected generate new alleles. Most mutations, first of all, mutation is random. It provides the raw material for evolution. It's random in respect to fitness. In other words, it's unlikely to create any sort of traits that are actually adaptive. But it does provide new genetic variation, and if it sticks around long enough, it might be incorporated in, okay? And between individuals and the population, by itself, mutation is a weak force of evolution. Natural selection that it, in combination with mutation becomes very strong. Mutation in terms of genetic drift, which we're going to look at next, also is becomes strong, but only when very small populations, whereas natural selection and mutation, natural selection becomes very strong in large populations. Okay. And so here's some things we can see that happen in evolution where mutation has played a big role in conjunction with natural selection. We have two uh, regulatory regions up here. Remember, um, uh, so we've got the functional gene and promoter regions. And in this case, there's two promoter regions. Okay, so we start out with this protein coding gene. It makes certain proteins, right? The whole process that we followed earlier. Um, sometimes... During replication, you get changes, and in this case, this gene, including the promoter region, was duplicated. Now we have two copies of this chromosome, of this gene, on a chromosome. Two copies, instead of one. Okay? Now, one thing that could happen is... Here, the regulatory region, one of the copy mutates and ceases to function. That's right here. Okay? The other one still functions. Okay? The other regulatory region still functions. And the genes, the coding regions are still identical. Okay. <clears throat> Now, if we follow the promoter that ceases to function, if we follow it, we find out that later on in evolution, the gene that ceased to function has gained a new function, namely this purple one. Okay? It's now a functional promoter region um, that's affecting transcription and translation. Okay? So we go from functional gene to non-functional gene to functional gene again. And not just functional promoter region, but it might um, affect how the actual gene is regulated downstream. Okay. Now, there's another thing that happened. We can see that there's duplication in the blue promoter regions. They're the same, right? In this way, they're the same. They're still functional until here you go from a new promoter. It's changed. There's been a mutation. The promoter region changes, and it might affect gene regulation. Okay. Now, also, if we go to the main coding region, 
So here we've got a gene duplication up here. Here's a duplication. And let's say we get a mutation. And it turns into a gene with no function. Okay? So it's called a pseudogene. It's got the same um, sequence on it. You can just exactly the same, except maybe um, there's a, a stop codon in the wrong place or uh, something else that, that makes it non-functional. Okay? So you've got the original functional gene, and then the duplicate becomes a pseudogene, kind of like um, eye, uh, salamanders that have lost eyes that function in a cave. Okay. Now, duplication in the gene, in the um, genes, in, into two identical regions, a regulatory region in one copy mutates and it ceases to function as, as it did before in duplication. Okay, right here. Each gene evolves to specialize in one of the functions of the original gene. Okay, so in this case, each gene, um, it might ha uh, produce the same protein, but it's got different, different regulatory apparatus in the promoter region. Okay, and then the other two promoter regions have been um, dysfunctional. They don't work anymore, and they don't do anything. Okay. So it might be like um, uh, monkeys uh, have tails, apes don't. It might be one little promoter region that's changed that stops the tail from growing. Okay. Again, we've seen this before. Humans have 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. These are all great apes, including our cells. It turns out... Great apes have 24 pairs or 48 uh, chromosomes. We have 23 pairs and 46. It's not that we lost a chromosome. It's that two ape chromosomes, 12 and 13, right here, fuse together. Uh, not, not there. Right there, fuse together in the human lineage and created a long, extra long chromosome two in humans. Okay, we know this because we've sequenced, remember the little, the four little letters that we've talked about, A and T and C and G? They're um, almost identical. Okay. And then <clears throat> sometimes you get a mutation where it's, you get a whole genome du duplication, where the whole genome goes, let's say we had, uh, we have um, uh, 23 pairs, let's say it duplicate the whole chromosome and we end up having 46 pairs. So this is what's happened with this bunch of plants. The ancestor looked like this. We have these in California and along the west coast, tar weeds. They have seven um, chromosomes, okay? All these other ones are in Hawaii. It turns out they're all closely related to the tarweeds, but they either have 14 or 13 chromosomes. And tarweeds all look the same. They're little plants uh, with... Um, um, uh, you know, flowers like uh, um, dandelions and things like that. But the duplication of these chromosomes allowed a whole bunch of variation in terms of phenotype. And Hawaii is very different, and you had all this evolution in what are called, um, um, they're called silver swords in Hawaii that evolved independently. It's about 32. Okay, now, genetic drift. Okay. So, 
Genetic drift causes changes in allele frequencies. In other words, it meets the definition of, of evolution from one generation to the next. But they don't change and they don't provide adaptive evolution. In other words, traits that are under natural selection, there's variation in those traits. Individuals are born with those variant. The traits that are most successful, of course, for natural selection, are the ones that survive and then reproduce with healthy offspring. Okay. It's and it's exactly like um cards. Um in poker I might be dealing to all of you. I deal a hand to one person, they've got a couple of eights. I deal again the next person they've got not even a, a pair nothing uh, they got a um let's say a um a queen high that's the highest card they have but no pairs or anything like that very bad hand another person a deal of cards too they've got three kings and then finally another person oh my god they've got a pair they've got two pair um a pair of tens and a pair of nines that's um pretty good but not as good actually as the three kings two two pairs not as good as the three kings and then finally we've got someone who's got three k three um three aces and um two twos they've got a full house that means a pair and a trip okay and that's the highest those individuals Let's say the individual with um that had a pair of eights they um they get one offspring and it makes it to adulthood. The individual with um nothing they don't they don't produce any offspring they're complete losers. three kings they get three offspring. two pairs they get two offspring and then a full house gets 10 offspring okay who's going to leave more uh more of their genes in the future generations the ones the, with a better one the, and that's how individuals are they're born with what they have they don't evolve they don't get extra cards okay you get what you have and you have to make the best of it okay Now. So that's adaptive evolution. <clears throat> Genetic drift is random with respect to um fitness and adaptation. You could let's say you get a um a mutation and it could drift depending on the population size where it becomes more prominent. So let's take a look. Okay. Here we are. <clears throat> So this is going to be very much like um flipping a coin. Okay? Group 1, the first person flips the coin 10 times and gets six heads. Group uh n- number t- two individual 3 and 4 flip it 10 times get they get five heads. Group 2 for some reason just by chance alone uh the first one gets only two heads and eight tails. The next one gets seven heads and three tails and then five and five. Okay. If you notice each head flip is worth how much? Well, 1 out of 10, right? That's 10%. So every time you flip a coin, that is a 10% change. So you can see that all these are could be followed by zeros. Okay? Um and um which we'll get to in the next group. But each time you change from one to another, it's a 10% difference. 
or uh, obviously if you go from 2 to 7, that's 50% difference. Okay? Okay. Now, that's a small group. That means you flip it 10 times, only 10 times. What would you expect if instead of flipping it 10 times, you, ex you flipped it 100 times? Well, instead of getting, when you do 10, you expect 5 and 5, but occasionally you get 6, sometimes you get 7, sometimes you get 2, very rarely, okay? And each flip is worth 10%. But with 100, when you flip it, you would expect 50 heads and 50 tails. But you're not going to get that. Also, each flip is now worth only one point. Okay? One percent. Okay, so you flip it a um, hundred times. And let's say, oh, amazingly, you get 61 heads and um, uh, 39 tails. The next one, you get 53 heads, 47 tails. 49 heads, 51 tails, 51 heads, 49. Okay? Each flip is only worth 1%. It's not as strong a difference. So, 5 out of 10 is 50. 49 out of 50 is, uh, it's 49, it's 49 50ths. Uh, one hundredths, rather. Okay? The same with group 2, 55, 65, 52, 50, less variation, because each flip, you're expecting 50, 50. And then if you did it with a thousand times, you would expect, these numbers are pretty bad, you would expect around 500 and 500. And most of the numbers would be, um, uh, for each individual, would be probably around... Um, you know, 520, uh, 470, something like that. That's only one-tenth of 1% 1 difference. So the effect with a larger number of flips is much smaller than the effect with only a few flips. What does this have to do with what we're talking about? Well, population size. Okay. It turns out Random fluctuations in allele frequencies from chance events in a finite population. So let's say I was walking along and I stepped on a butterfly and killed it. Now, that's a random event unless it happened a lot and certain butterflies were less likely to get stepped on, it's completely random in nature. And it would not cause evolution by natural selection. It has to be an event that happens again and again and again, and that there's variation, and certain variations work better than others. Okay. So, let's say this random event where I step on a butterfly. Of course, it's lost. It's the alleles are lost, but it doesn't matter much. Okay. Especially if there's, um, let's say, lots and lots of butterflies. Uh, let's say there's a million butterflies, you lose one, you still have um, 999,999. Okay. But if, let's say, it's an endangered species, and there's only 10 butterflies. Okay? There's 10 butterflies, you lose one. Now there's nine butterflies. You have a 10% reduction in the number of butterflies. In fact, let's say there were only four of these butterflies left. If I stepped on one of them, there are only three now. There's only 75% as many butterflies as there were to be before. Okay. Now, no, most genetic drift is not caused by random events like that. It has to do, actually, with what we learned about in reproduction. If you remember, you're diploid. And your gametes, if you remember what happens during meiosis, 
um, the ch it's a random chance of getting a a gene on one chromosome from your father or your mother. It's like flipping a coin, the same sort of thing. So depending on which gamete fertilizes which, um, uh, let's say which sperm fertilizes which egg, you can have these different combinations, four different combinations, and then with 23 different, of course, um, uh, uh, chromosomes, that's a very, very large number. And by four, I mean, if your father uh, donates um, a sperm and it's got, he can either uh, donate a chromosome from his father or from his mother, 50%. And the gamete will have either one from his mother or one from his father. Okay, that's two. Mom, the same thing. That's your grandma. Uh, she'll donate either one from, let's say, your grandma and the other one, or the other one from your grandpa. It's again 50%. Okay? The chance that means that this is random event. Which chromosome you get in terms of your genes from your parents is a random event in terms of which chromosomes you got from their parents. Okay? And this is the basis for most genetic drift. So, and by the way, if a population was infinitely large, no such thing, but if it was infinitely large, there would be no gen genetic drift. Okay? Even when it's very, very large, there's going to be hardly any genetic uh, drift. But there'll still be some, okay? But it'll act more like um, a population where uh, it's a very large population, okay? So random fluctuations of allele frequencies, that means generation to generation, from chance events in finite, not infinitely large populations. Drift is strongest in small populations. Okay. Okay. That means, and why is that? Well, remember when we were flipping coins, if you only flip, if you have a population size of 10, each coin flip is worth 10%. If you have a population size of 100, each flip is worth 1%. A thousand one tenth of one percent. Okay, that's the same reason that small populations with few numbers, there's a good chance that just by chance alone you're going to lose certain alleles because you only get so many flips. Whereas in a large population, you're probably going to get 50 percent alleles are not going to disappear randomly. So let's take a look at this. Okay. So, population size of four. That's like four individuals, and that's like flipping a coin four times. Each flip is worth 25 points. We have a number of different populations. Now, with population size of four, that's very small. That means genetic drift is very, very strong. And if we were to run this in a simulation, let's say each population, we've got two populations, one in red and one in blue, but we've also got these other ones, um, one and two and three and four, two more populations in gray. Just because of Genetic drift, because there's only four individuals and those chromosomes that you get either from your mom or your dad, you can quickly lose one allele or fix one allele. So in this case, A1, um, if A1 goes up in frequency, it goes to 1. 
that means it's become fixed. Okay? That's fixed. That's with four flips. Great deal of variation. You flip it again four times. In this case, you lose this allele from the population. The same thing happens A1 in this population, this population. In this population, it's fixed, and this is fixed. Okay. That means in population 1, Allele A1 has drifted to fixation in less than 20 generations. And along the axis, you see generation time. Okay. Okay. Population size 400. Okay. Is this a large population or a small population? Well, much larger than 4. 100 times larger. Would you expect... Remember, drift is strongest in a small population. This is a lot of variation right here. All over the place, right? Larger population, less genetic drift. In fact, it's like flipping a coin 400 times. And so you still get drift going on. You still have these populations, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I think. Okay? But in this case, none of the populations lose A1. Or none of the populations fix A A1 and lose A2. Okay? So there's two alleles here, A1 and A2. These are just mirror opposites. In other words... In this population right here, the blue line, that's A2 is becoming more frequent. In the red line, above where you started, which was 50%, A1 is becoming more frequent. If you gave enough time to this, let's say you went out um, 10,000 generations, you might eventually lose A1 or fix A1 in a population. Okay. But the thing is, drift is strongest in small populations. That's the thing you have to remember in terms of how allele frequencies change. They change rapidly in a small population. Just because of random events in terms of which chromosome the gametes get. Drift is even significantly, even in moderately large populations, like 400, it would be even less uh, in a population of 10 million. Okay? Okay. So that's drift. Now, drift reduces genetic variation also. Remember, if you look at this, these things, you realize, okay, you have two alleles, A1 and A2. This is the frequency of each of A1 allele. If up here, where this drift is strong, you are losing alleles. In the red one, it goes up and fixes A1. In other words, you've lost A2. A2 in the population has now gone extinct. In this blue, A1 has gone extinct and A2 has been become fixed. And then there's these other gray populations, some of which fix A2 and lose A1 completely or the other way around. Okay, so this is a small population. In bigger populations, drift is less, so it reduces, but any way you look at it, you can lose genetic variation in a small population because of drift. Okay, it does not produce a fit between the organism and its environment like natural selection does. It's completely random in terms of, uh, let's say you get one allele or another. 
one allele is favored, um, maybe, uh, you know, um, occasionally, uh, the other allele is much better, so it gives an, an, an individual an advantage, but whether you get one allele or another, it's completely random. Okay. So, this is more about gene pool. Remember, in diploid organisms, the population creates the gene pool. You have twice as many alleles in the population as you have individuals, because each person has two alleles. So, in the face of environmental change, like a selective pressure, which is more likely to go extinct? A, a species with a very large gene pool or a species with a small gene pool? There's a species with a, a small gene pool um, might have the same proportion of alleles, but there's only a few individuals, and if certain individuals um, um, die, there's a chance that the popul whole population will go extinct. So it's small. Why are they more likely? There are few alleles um, that natural selection can work on. Selection when the environment changes, it's going to favor, selection is going to um, favor a variant in that new environment that might be different than the variant in the old environment. But with a larger population, you generally have more variation and natural selection works stronger, like the opposite of genetic drift in a small population. So the bigger the population, the more likely there's going to be at least some gene variants that survive in that new, that new environment. It's just different from the old one. A small population, that it's less likely. There might only be one individual with this one allele versus um, um, 100,000 in a very, very large population. And so that one individual can be lost just because of random chance. So there are fewer alleles in that, uh, natural selection can walk on, um, act on. Genetic drift has a larger effect on small populations, or both B and A and B are true, true. Species are more likely to evolve rapidly by natural selection if they have a small population with a small gene pool or a large population with a large gene pool. Natural selection, large. Now, <clears throat> Here we are still talking about population size. Okay, so <clears throat> how might certain populations change in number? Occasionally, you can have a catastrophic effect. Let's say, um, <clears throat> uh, back in the 14th century, bubonic plague came along and wiped out half of all the people in Europe, or maybe even more, okay? That was catastrophic, it, and all those individuals who died, the alleles that they had were lost, and the whole European population, therefore, probably lost certain alleles that completely, completely gone, okay? So, ge ge genetic drift, um, or yeah, losing all that population made the population smaller and you lost alleles. This is what's called the genetic bottleneck, <clears throat> where you go from a large population to a small population. <clears throat> so, because you reduce the population size, what does it do? It increases drift. Okay? This is likely to change allele frequencies right? Um, you're probably going to lose potential loss of certain alleles. And it's going to... Homozygosity means... Remember when you have homozygous for a certain genotype, you've got big A, big A, or A1, A1. Or heterozygous, uh, A1, A2. 
okay? With a small population and a genetic bottleneck, you're going to have less heterozygosity. In other words, you're going to have fewer alleles. So, bottlenecks greatly reduce genetic variation, in northern, and it's been demonstrated this in northern elephant seals, it looks like have gone through a population bottleneck. Uh, cheetahs have too. So, this is what happens. Um, we've got A1 and A2. Uh, individuals who are A1 um, are A1A1 are red. Uh, A2, A2 are blue. And heterozygous A1, A2 are purple. Okay? So this is a fairly large population. Um, there's, I don't know how many individuals are in here. Let's say a disease comes along and wipes out a whole bunch. And all that's left are four individuals. There are no A1A1s. There's three A2A2s. And there's one heterozygote A1A2. So, in this population, we've got equal number of alleles. Okay? Um, we have 50% A1 and 50% A2. Uh, many of those, as we can see, are purple. That means they're heterozygotes. Okay. <clears throat> In this population, they've all been wiped out. All that's left, there's actually only one A1 allele left in this population. It's in this one, because remember this is A1, A2. Okay? There's no A2, A1, A1. No red ones. And there's three A2s, that's six. Okay? So, uh, one A... You've got one A1. And then from this one, one A2. And then you've got A2, A2, that's two, 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 two. So you've got seven A2s and only one A1 from this genetic bottleneck. You've lost all the diversity from the initial population, which was much larger. Okay? And now this small population, furthermore, as it goes along, it's much more subject to genetic drift, and you might lose... Even if A1 is favored by selection, there's only one copy of it, and it might not be passed on to any offspring. And so you might get a population that's all A2. Okay. Similar is something called the founder effect. The founder effect is actually a type of genetic bottleneck. But instead of the whole population, let's say, being affected by some catastrophe. The founder effect is from dispersal. So, a new population is started by only a few members of the original population. Just like a bottleneck. In fact, the po population is going through a bottleneck. But in this case, we've got dispersal going to this new island, let's say. And a new population starts. And in this population, we've got A1, A1, A2, A2, and A1, A2. A1, A1 is red. A2, A2 is blue. And so on. And this new population, three members, let's say it's birds of a species, they fly to an island. During a hurricane, they get blown off course. They establish a new population and they survive. Which alleles they have is probably random. Okay. And in this case, you have two um, individuals that are A1 and A1. So, that's four. 
And then you ha also have one A1, A2, so another A1, 5. And then you've got one A2, A2. Okay? So, now you've gone to a new island and started a new population instead of the population in place uh, is drastically reduced. It's still a genetic bottleneck, though, because genetically there's much less variation there. And in this population, you've almost lost uh, A2 entirely. There's only one copy of it, unlike the other one. So, again, it creates also a founder effect in that it creates a genetic drift. The new population started only by a few members. Reduced genetic variation again. You go from a large population with lots of genetic variation right here. All these different alleles. And disproportionate representation of certain um, alleles that get into the population and are much more frequent than they normally would be in the population. Okay. Now, this can have far-reaching effects. So, there's this island in the um, Atlantic that is a, a British colony. At one point, Britain was had all these islands that are colonies. Um, some of them are still there, um, like uh, the um, Falkland Islands off of the Argentine coast. Um, okay, this one, we can see it. The British, a British ship, decided to colonize. They got, ended up with 15 colonists. Uh, I don't know how many uh, men and women, but there was a mix. This was in 1814. Okay. The population started small. It was under drift, right? Um, <clears throat> as the population grew, got much larger... I don't know how many people are living on this island now. But it turns out that one individual, one of the original colonists, had um, a recessive deleterious gene that causes what's called retinitis pigmentosa. Now, to get it, you need two copies. So he didn't have it. His vision was fine, his or her. And... In just by drift alone, because there were so few, this um, this gene increased in frequency. Also, remember, an individual who only had one copy of it had fine vision. It was only those individuals that had two. But let's say if we had started with a population of a million, you would have had one that one allele out of one million. But now you've got that one allele out of 15, much more frequent. So this allele was brought into this population. No one knew it. It's autosomal recessive. In other words, you need two copies. And when you get two copies, you, had, you end up with, you're blind. This allele now, now in, in, our, in Britain, the frequency at that time of, of retinitis pigmentosa was probably one out of a million or 10 out of a million, something like that. Very low incidence. This is much higher now because now one out of 15 and then it might have even gone more than that. And so now this population nowadays has a much, this allele is much more common 10 times higher frequency on the island than in the, among the regular British population. And those poor individuals with two copies are blind. All because of the founder effect. Okay. Non-random mating. What are the causes of non-random mating? Well, made choice or um, let's say fighting between same sex, you could have uh, a sorted of mating, like here, these kind of purple, purple, green, green, 
You could have disordinative mating, where instead of this, you get these two. And either way you look at it, this causes inbreeding. It actually reduces, in effect, the effective population size. Okay? So, non-random mating doesn't actually change allele frequencies, it changes genotype frequencies. But you still end up with a loss of genetic diversity, and then you have either inbreeding or outbreeding depression, where the population has problems. And it has an increased risk of harmful mutations. And we can see this, what happens in a highly inbred population where there's strong assortative mating. It turns out in um, the Egyptian empire, um, the royals were all one family. And you commonly had two offspring that were very closely related to each other. They were either first cousins, in some cases e even for, uh, siblings, complete siblings. Okay? So, because you can't have a godlike king or emperor uh, breeding with a common person. It's just not going to happen. Okay, so if you do this over and over again, over, let's say, um, 50 or 100 generations, what happens? Well, these are incestuous marriages, and it turns out they've gotten the DNA from these mummies, and they show that there's a lot of inbreeding. And it also, a lot of these mummies show um, health problems, really serious health problems. So, King Tut, it turns out, he only lived until he was 19. But his mother and father were actually full bro brother and sister. Okay? In other words, the, the pharaoh, the pharaoh and his sister were the ones that made it and produced offspring. And he was one of them. Now, they also were the product of of incestuous marriage, which basically reduces the, the population a lot. And when that happens, uh, deleterious or bad mutations that are recessive are more likely to happen, just like with the founder effect. King Tut had a club foot. He had really a screwed up foot bones, probably all part of the same mutation. He also had a cleft palate. One of the things that you do remember with inbreeding is you lose a lot of alleles, so there's not much genetic diversity. And it turns out our immune systems depend on genetic diversity. The more diverse our immune systems, the more likely they are to recognize and be able to fight um, uh, a microorganism. So it turns out he also had multiple malarial infections over and over again. Uh, he was very susceptible and probably that's what he died from. And he actually managed to breed uh, probably to either a sister or a half-sister or something like that. And both the babies were born stillborn. In other words, lethal mutations where you don't even end up with a, an offspring that survives into infanthood. Okay? The same thing happened um, in the royal family in Europe. Um, and we've already gone that. For example, um, the royal family in Europe, one of the most common features was the royal disease, which is hemophilia on the X chromosome, so it was X-linked. And in other words, mostly boys were the ones that were hemophiliacs. And you can actually look at like the Habsburgs were one of the primary royal fam families, and they were still related to all the other ones. There's this Habsburg face and jaw, and they look 
like the strangest group of most inbred individuals you've ever seen. And that's because there's all this inbreeding depression. Okay, and then finally, the last force is gene flow and migration and dispersal. That's the last force that will affect um, changes in allele frequencies, in other words, evolution. You have, let's say, two populations. Well, so we can see this. Um, we've got, let's say, butterflies. We've got wildebeests, um, all these birds, um, humans migrating different places, um, gametes floating around. Okay. They can disperse. So, <clears throat> let's say you have two populations. In this case, we've got a population on one side that's all big A, big A. Okay? This one right here. And then we've got a population of little a, little a. Okay. And these populations are separated by a river. And so they're more likely to breed within themselves. So each subpopulation, let's say, is, um, uh, is separate from the other population. And let's say also, let's say this is a huge, huge river. Okay. And it's very difficult to even fly across. Okay? Now let's say, though, that the river shrinks. Okay? To what it is now. And birds from either population can actually fly across. Let's say a bird from here from little a, little a, flies across, carrying little a, little a alleles. And suddenly, you've got alleles coming into this population. So, instead of having all these big A, big A's, you now have big A, little a. And let's say these birds can actually interbreed. They just have different alleles, but they're the same species. In this case, there's gene flow. That means genes, AA, the genomes, the alleles, go from one population to the next. It's as simple as that. When they do that, it usually makes the population they go to more genetically diverse. In this case, very much so. There were no little a, little a alleles, or no little a alleles at all, and now there are. And if there's breeding, they might increase in frequency. Now, if there's lots of gene flow going on, as in this case, so here we've got two populations at time one, okay? All red, A1, A1, all two, uh, A2, A2. What's going to happen? Let's say there's lots of gene flow. In other words, flying back and forth. Birds from, let's say, this um, population fly over to this population, okay? Okay, so there's lots of gene flow going back. Eventually, what happens when there's migration and gene flow, gene flow makes each population more like each other. So in this, these populations at time one are very different from each other. In fact, the population uh, one is all A1, A1. There are no A2 alleles. Population A2 or population two is all A2, A2. Homozygous. No heterozygosity. When there is migration going on, there's red going into the blue population, into the population two, and population two individuals flying into one. And if this went on long enough, you would have uh, an equal number of alleles in both, and you'd have a homogenized population that looked very much like each other. In fact, it would very much act now like one whole population. Okay? So gene flow 
the movement of alleles from one population to another, it, like mutation, it introduces new alleles into a population. It reduces genetic differences. So remember, they were totally different populations beforehand. And now they're, they're have similar numbers of alleles and they're probably interbreeding too and so in producing heterozygotes, A1 and A2, that are purple. And the homogenizing, that means the populations, which are now almost like one population, become more and more alike in terms of the frequency of the alleles. Okay. So this is going to take us into speciation because when you stop gene flow from happening, you isolate populations. So let me um, show you. And that's how you get separate. Okay. So lack of gene flow. So when you, with gene flow, you make, you get hybrids, and if they still have good fitness, the populations emerge into one big large population. But if you strict gene flow, then you get separate populations. Okay, there are, this is the Grand Canyon. At one time, there was no Grand Canyon. There was just a big plateau. There was one species of squirrel, the kaibab squirrel, and they obviously they were the squirrels were all over the place. Um, squirrel, 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 squirrel. They interbred. They were one species, right? The most common recent ancestor. Then about um, uh, 7 million years ago, or it's changing now, who knows what it was, uh, a river that was nearby or was created uh, changed course and cut right through this plateau. And actually, the plateau was actually way down here, and there was uplift. So... These, this plateau was lower and it started rising and there was a river going through it and it cut down into it and actually um, cut the, the two plateaus in half. This is on the south side and this is the north. Okay. With that river... Now, squirrels, unlike birds, don't fly. Um, uh, and before they could walk across, but they can't do that anymore. Okay? So there was gene flow all across this plateau, and now there's two plateaus. This plateau, we'll say this north plateau, and the south plateau, and each plateau has a different squirrel species on it. This is squirrels over here. Mm. Okay. And we've got then this other group. And of squirrels that have evolved. And the two plateaus are now, they're different. One's higher by about a 1,500 feet. Um, and there's other differences. And so where there used to be one species, there's now two. Uh, one is the castle-haired squirrel over here. Um, and the other one is the kaibab squirrel, this ground squirrels. Okay? So... Gene flow makes populations more similar. So if, let's say, we remove the Colorado River and there was then 
easy access across it between the two squirrel populations, they might interbreed or it might have been too long since they were last together and they've got reproductive isolation. Okay. So <clears throat> we have, let's say, one big population and we've got alleles, alleles, Okay. Now let's say, um, oh, here, actually, don't, let's not do that. Okay, here we go. We've got two populations, two populations. We've got gene flow going on. gene flow going on, right? Okay. So, they become more and more alike over time. In fact, it's more like one all population. But what happens if you stop gene flow? Well, there's no more gene flow going on, so the populations are now separate. Okay, so we've got a big barrier here. And the populations, there might be differences in selection going on between the two populations. They become more and more different species. Over time, these two populations might end up different species. And their species, they're so different that they can't even breed together. And then finally, something called horizontal gene transfer. And it's happening more and more often. So this is where organisms exchange DNA. Bacteria do a lot. They have something called con conjugation where they slip, they, um, um, swap circular strands of, D of DNA. And so each bacteria suddenly gets new DNA along with their old DNA. And this can even happen between very different species of bacteria. And it's one of the reasons that um, antibiotic resistance is increasing so fast because bacteria are s swapping circular strands of alleles that make the bugs, uh, the bacteria resistant. There's also a lot more hybridization going on than used to be found. Also, it turns out viruses that infect one species often carry some DNA from that species and that DNA is incorporated into a new species D genome. Okay, so horizontal gene transfer is becoming recognized as more and more important. That's enough.